Let's just get into the sermon tonight. So tonight I'm going to talk, I just wanted, I was just reflecting on a verse in Hosea. Um, and that basically says, uh, you know, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. So I was just reflecting on that verse, and I know uh, obviously the immediate context of that verse is that they were not obeying the commandments of God, and God destroyed, you know, and, and put that curse on them. But there is that New Testament principle where we can be destroyed spiritually for a lack of knowledge. And that is one of the dangers we see today where a lot of Christians do not possess the knowledge and either they are then as not as effective as they could be as a witness for Jesus Christ and as an ambassador for Jesus Christ, or they end up leaving the faith because maybe they can't answer all the questions, they don't have the knowledge, and then their faith is made shipwreck. You know, they basically just destroyed as a Christian. And not saying that they would necessarily lose their salvation, right? You can't lose your salvation even if you get away from the faith or you quit church or, you know, you decide, you know what, I'm done with Christianity just because you have a lack of knowledge. But you can definitely be destroyed spiritually and um, just with what's going on right now with same-sex marriage and people having to defend the bible i feel like christianity has come under a lot of attack and christians are not always able to answer all the attacks that come and in the eyes of the public christianity is being destroyed as something that is a valid belief um, and something that is reasonable and logical so my sermon today is just touching on that issue. I'm not going into any specifics itself, but just the, the, the principle of getting knowledge and being a knowledgeable Christian and knowing what you believe and why you believe it. We don't want to be destroyed for lack of knowledge. Why? Because there's a danger, right? There's a danger of having a lack of knowledge, right? It's a dangerous thing for Christians to have a, a lack of knowledge. And like I said, it's not just in your own spiritual life, but it's also if you want to be effective, right? Because we're always under attack. There's always people that want to convince people that the Bible's not the word of God, that salvation is another way. And if we have a lack of knowledge, not only will we destroy ourselves, but we will contribute to the destruction of Christianity because we are not able to fight that destruction. We are not able to, um, you know, uh, effectively go against the destruction that is happening not only in our country but all around the world and online and whatnot so we already read this verse where it says my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge but i just wanted to show you as well that even in hosea right it wasn't only the generation of people that had the lack of knowledge that were affected but it says seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy god i will also forget thy children so now we, we want to keep in mind that this verse in Hosea is in, under the Old Covenant. It's talking about the blessing and cursing of God. So it's not that if we have no knowledge, God is obviously going to curse our children. But what, what the principle we can gather from here is our actions and our level of knowledge, our effectiveness, it's not just going to affect this generation, but it's going to affect the next generation as well. And that's why when people talk about, even with the same-sex marriage argument, and they say, well, it doesn't affect you, but I'm not the only one I'm worried about. Do you know what I mean? I don't just take a stand because it doesn't affect me. Yeah, there are a lot of things that don't affect me, like abortion, for example, doesn't affect me in the sense that I'm not going to abort my children. I'm never going to go to an abortion clinic and get abortion done. It's not going to, abortion is not going to kill my children. But does that mean I don't care whether abortion is legal or not? No, because it has another effect. It has an effect on other people. It affects the, the, the psychology and, the, and, and, and what people believe and what is generally accepted in a society. It makes it that much more difficult then to fight the more we accept. And that's the problem with same-sex marriage. That's one problem with same-sex marriage, right? Where, you know, the more we accept, the more we turn up this, this boiling water and killing the frog, the harder it is, it's gonna, it, it, the harder it will be for us to get back to what God actually intended, which is what we see in the Bible and the laws we see in the Bible. Let me show you a couple of other verses where we just see this danger of a lack of knowledge. Uh, Job 38, I, I found that these two verses in Job were quite interesting. It says, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? 
So you see, a lot of, see, not all counsel is good, right? We, there's wise counsel and then there's evil counsel. And we need to judge that by the word of God. So what does it mean here where it says you darken counsel? So the idea I get here is when there is counsel out, there is good counsel out there, but words without knowledge actually sort of darken and cloud that good counsel. You know, there's like this good counsel that's clear, that's simple, that's right, but then counsel without knowledge starts to cloud the simplicity of that counsel. You know, it's darkening the counsel that is out there. Whereas in Job 42.3, it says, who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge. So you see how words without knowledge not only cloud and darken good counsel, but also if somebody doesn't have knowledge, it's almost like hiding that counsel because there is counsel out there that is good, right? That is profitable, that is helpful in the word of God. But if we don't have the knowledge, it's almost like hiding that truth that could be revealed, that could be given to people to give them good counsel. See, therefore have I uttered that I understood not, things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. This is uh, Job uh, responding there to God in Job 42. What about Romans 10.2, where it says, For I bear them record, Paul talking about the Jews, saying here, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So you see, so zeal is good, but zeal can do a lot of damage if zeal is done. A lot of works are done not according to knowledge, right? Because you can be doing a lot for God or trying to do a lot for God, but you're actually doing damage to the cause of Christ because you don't have the knowledge of God. Now, as Christians, we ought to seek knowledge, right? We ought to be people that desire to learn, desire to know more. You know, we should always be learning. You should never feel like you know enough. Like, you know, like some, uh, you know, you go out soul winning and you talk to some people, especially people of the older generation, right? And they have this attitude where they're like, yeah, I, I know all that. You know, I went to all the Sunday school classes. I went to church. You know, I've done the Christian thing. I know all that. And they have this prideful attitude where they cannot be taught anything more and that's a very dangerous thing as christians we ought to be constantly learning constantly seeking knowledge constantly trying to learn more you know yes we, we don't know everything we have to acknowledge that we do not know everything and that we should be constantly learning and worshiping god not only with our heart you know our soul and strength but also with our mind learning more look at proverbs eighteen fifteen: the heart of the prudent getteth knowledge and the ear of the wise seeketh knowledge. So you see, it's prudent and it's wise to get knowledge. And also you can't, you know, obviously you can't be wise. It's kind of a, it's a bit of both. That's why you always see wisdom and knowledge together. Wisdom is the application of knowledge, right? You get knowledge, you learn truth, and then wisdom is how you apply that truth and how you actually act, out, act upon that knowledge that you gain. This is something that God actually desires for every Christian. You can see here as it's expressed through the letters of Paul, through the letters of Peter, where it says, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Now, I just underlined, you know, your love, because we, we can't just be imbalanced, right? We need to grow in grace and in truth. Because a lot of people, they grow in a lot of knowledge, you know, and, and, and too much knowledge sometimes is, is a dangerous thing without love and grace because knowledge can puff it up. It can make people proud. It can make people arrogant, right? It can make people unloving because they just come down with a hard hammer and they don't have that balance with love and with the grace. But we see here that God doesn't just want us to grow just in knowledge. He wants us to also grow in our character, to grow in love, because then we will handle that knowledge correctly. Right? Because if you just have a lot of knowledge, but not a lot of love, you can do a lot of damage. Just like you know, the apostles, they had the authority to speak, right? and they could use it for edification or they could use it for destruction. Right? And both these things can be done uh, with knowledge. But see, look, we should be growing here. We grow in our love. Our love may abound yet more and more in knowledge. And look at this, and in all judgment. So isn't it interesting, you know, we talked about people thinking that, you know, Christianity is just this no judge religion, whereas in judgment is something God does want us to grow in. Because as we grow in love, we grow in knowledge, obviously we're going to grow in judgment as well, because now we're going to know more about what is right and wrong, and we shouldn't be keeping our mouth closed about it. We should be speaking about these things and talking about them, letting people know, and obviously that is going to be judgmental. You know, a lot of the judging that is condemned in the Bible is when we can 
condemn a brother or sister. You know, when we don't want to judge our brother, when we write people off, don't give them a chance and things like that. But obviously, the discerning, the righteous judgment, the rebuking sin, saying things, you know, calling a spade a spade, they say when something is wrong, you call it wrong. That's the sort of judgment we should be increasing in. Uh, 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in grace. So I just wanted to sh show you there that love and that grace that we want to grow in as well. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Now, this is something, you know, like knowledge is, is something we ought to be seeking, you know, wisdom and knowledge. And this is something that, that Solomon was praised for. This is what made Solomon such a wise king, because when, when God asked him, what do you want? He asked for wisdom and understanding. And we see a short summary of the story here. There's, a, there's an account of it in Samuel as well. But in 2 Chronicles 1, we'll read here, In that night did God appear unto Solomon and said unto him, Ask what I shall give thee. I mean, what, what a request, right? I mean, it's almost like, you know, you imagine like the genie in the bottle, right? Where it says you get three wishes. I mean, imagine the God of the universe coming to you and saying, you can ask for absolutely anything you want. But look at what Solomon asked for. He says, And Solomon said unto God, Thou hast showed great mercy unto David my father, and hast made me to reign in his stead. Now, O Lord God, let thy promise unto David my father be established, for thou hast made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this thy people that is so great? And God said to Solomon, Because this was in thine heart, and thou hast not asked riches, wealth, or honour, nor the life of thine enemies, neither yet hast asked long life, but hast asked wisdom and knowledge for thyself, that thou mayest judge my people over whom I have made thee king. So God acknowledges that Solomon asked for a right thing. When it was, look at what it's compared to. It's compared to riches and wealth. It's compared to honour, the respect and, the, and, and your, your reputation. Uh, it's compared to, you know, obviously the revenge and, you know, people wanting to get revenge and, and the life of their enemies, um, you know, this power and these winning their wars. Neither yet has asked long life, even longevity. Wisdom and knowledge was greater than all these things that God said, hey, you've asked for something that was even better than riches, wealth, honor, life of your enemies and long life. And that was wisdom and knowledge for yourself. That thou mayest judge my people over whom I've made thee king. So you see there that as we increase in knowledge, we increase in judgment, right? So Because he wanted the wisdom, he wanted the knowledge to make it uh, make it uh, so he was a better judge, right? Wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee, and I will give thee. So, not, so God honoured this request, and in, and in doing so, he also gave him all the other things that he didn't ask for. And I will give thee riches and wealth and honour, such as none of the kings have had that have been before thee, neither shall there any after thee have the like. And this is where we learn that King Solomon was the wisest and the richest man that ever lived because God said himself that he would give these things to him and there will never be a king like him before neither shall there ever be a king like that after him uh, obviously in, in the uh, in the human sense right because Jesus being God is obviously going to be a wiser and a richer king than uh, any um, uh, man uh, alone let's go into Proverbs 8 and we, we see here again that knowledge and, and, and us seeking knowledge should be desired even more than riches. Proverbs 8, receive my instruction and not silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. Now often we, in living in this world, we often go the other way around, right? Where we stop learning at work, we get comfortable at work and we're just seeking to make more money Whereas there's nothing wrong with making money. Obviously, there's a place for that. But what should be more desired than chasing silver and gold? It's receiving instruction. It's receiving knowledge. It's learning more. For wisdom is better than rubies. And all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. So the Bible is painting this very clear picture that, you know, we, we often desire the riches. We often think, yeah, it's right up there with knowledge. But God is saying, no, 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 knowledge and wisdom does not even compare to, um, sorry, gold and silver does not even compare to wisdom and knowledge. 
So that's Proverbs 8. Proverbs 20, 15. There is gold and a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. Isn't that interesting? So even though, even though a ruby, in a sense, is a jewel, you know, maybe there are obviously jewels that are, are more valuable because they are more scarce than, um, than rubies. Um, so I'm not too sure there. I'm not really a, a gem expert. So what are some ways? What are some ways to obtain knowledge? And obviously, you know, this is nothing. This is not rocket science, you guys. You guys know how to obtain knowledge. But just a reminder uh, for us today, and an exhortation to obtain knowledge. You know, don't be a Christian that is ignorant and unknowledgeable. You need to to learn things. You need to be constantly learning. Be a Christian that knows what they're talking about. You don't want to be like the Muslims we talk to out soul winning. Where you know they're a Muslim, they'll live a Muslim, die a Muslim. But then you ask them about Islam, and they have no idea what do they say to you uh, you better go talk to the imam to find out what is the truth you know find out more about my religion because they don't even know anything about their religion you don't want to be like that sort of christian when people talk to you and you don't know what you believe you don't know why you believe it you don't even you didn't even know that christianity taught something and you need to direct people to me or direct people to somebody else to get the answers no it's much it's always better if you know the answers it's always more effective you know, just think about it um you know, even in my own life, a lot of people, um, you know, they, they won't necessarily, you know, like when I was a younger Christian, if I was talking to them, if I could get them the answers, generally that was more effective because they were willing to talk to me. I had a relationship with them. Whereas if you're going to say to somebody, hey, I'm going to take you somewhere to talk to some expert, I mean, generally people are adverse to that. They don't, they don't necessarily want to go up against somebody that, you know, they know is much more knowledgeable than them, um, you know, because they're, they're a bit more adverse to that. But if you have the answers as their friend or as the person that has a relationship with them and you can share with them, that may give them the opportunity to hear something that they would never hear from somebody like me that may never get an opportunity to talk to them. So all of us have to be experts. All of us are ambassadors for Christ, not just the bishop of a local church. All of us need to have that mentality so that we can be an effective witness when we talk to people in our day-to-day -day life and get that opportunity. So let's go look at a couple of verses uh, where the Bible talks about obtaining knowledge. And obviously, Proverbs is the book that is well known for wisdom and knowledge and gaining understanding. I just want to show you the first couple of verses in Proverbs where it talks about gaining understanding, gaining knowledge. It says, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. So we can see how obviously we're reading these Proverbs. So one obvious way we can get knowledge is by reading. Right? We need to read the Word of God. And you need to read the Word of God daily and study it. That's where you're going to get that knowledge. If you are, have been a believer for a long time and you haven't read through the Bible, you don't read the Bible through regularly, you are backsliding. You are falling away from what God expects from you because you need to be constantly reading and learning and understanding the Word. It says to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. See, so you've got to do reading. You've got to read the words to get these words of understanding. The words are there for you. But if you don't read them, you'll never gain that knowledge. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice and judgment and equity. To give subtlety to the simple and to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear, right? So they will not only read the bible but they'll also hear what people have to say right you'll learn uh you know they say that's why god gave us two ears you know people say god gave us two ears but one mouth because he wants us to listen twice as much as we speak so you have to be willing to listen so you you can learn through preaching as well so it's not that the bible is the only source where you, from your own reading where you're going to gain knowledge you're going to hear it as well when people preach the bible and you might listen to sermons you might listen to an audio sermon and things like that and will increase learning and a man of understanding shall obtain unto wise counsels so we see here the reading we see the preaching of god's word but what's the wise counsel the wise counsel when i think of that is like the discussion amongst god's people of the bible so that's another way where you can gain understanding is you talk about it with fellow brothers and sisters in christ you sharpen one another and you learn more that's a great great way to learn as well uh, to understand a proverb and the interpretation 
the words of the wise and their dark sayings. So you can see that it's words that we read, that we hear, that we discuss about as we learn more knowledge of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So you have to have a certain level of fear of God to actually want to learn more about God. So if you don't care about the things that God, if you don't care about the things of God, you're not going to try and learn about the things of God. So you have to have a certain level of fear of the Lord to even want to, first of all, seek the knowledge of the Lord. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. See, if you don't want to learn anymore, if you don't want to learn about the things of God, then the Bible calls you a fool because you don't want to do what God says to do. Uh, look at verse 8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Another way we can gain knowledge is that we listen to our parents. We listen to our parents that have knowledge in the law. Yes, not all of us have saved parents, but that doesn't mean there aren't things that we can learn, we, we can learn from our parents. Even our parents aren't saved. They have wisdom and knowledge that we can learn, and you need to be willing to hear your father and your mother. And especially if your father and, and mother are saved believers in Christ, these people you ought to listen to because they've gone through life before you. They have a lot of wisdom and knowledge. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. Daniel 9.2, I want to show you a couple of verses where even in the Bible, people uh, gain knowledge through reading. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So it's interesting that Daniel is known as somebody that's very wise in the Bible. And yes, he was given the interpretation of dreams and he was given a lot of wisdom through revelation, but he also gained a lot of wisdom just by reading. Where it says here that the reason why he knew some of the timeline, and it says here uh, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem, how did he know this? because he understood by books the number of years. He read about it. He had studied and learned it. Isn't that interesting? So it wasn't just that Daniel only had this supernatural revelation and, and this wisdom, but also he was a wise man because he actually did reading and studied to learn and gain that knowledge. Look at what it says here, uh, uh, what Paul writes here in Ephesians 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which has given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made unto, known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. See, Paul was given many revelations to the point where he was given a thorn in the flesh, right? Lest he should be exalted above measure because of the revelations that he was given in Christ. But see, we can understand those revelations that Paul has. Why? Because they are written and we can understand them when we read them. But see, if you don't read them, you're not going to know what those revelations are. You're not going to understand those revelations. So it's interesting there that he says there, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Let's uh, look at Proverbs 19. So I wanted to show you this verse. We're going on to now counsel. You know, when we talked about, you know, attaining unto wise counsel. But remember, not all counsel is good counsel. You know, you need to judge it by the word of God. So we see here, hear counsel and receive instruction, that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. So it's not that just because you're receiving counsel and people are giving you advice that that's always a good thing to do. It's a good thing to follow. You know, you need to check all that counsel. It's like you need to check my preaching as well. You listen to my preaching. Don't just believe it. You know, you need to, you need to search the scriptures daily, whether those things are so. Are the things that I'm teaching you actually biblical? You know, it's not just because I'm teaching you that you just absorb it and you just accept it, you just regurgitate it. No, you're meant to hear what I preach, you receive what I preach, and then you check the scriptures daily whether those things are so. You need to make sure that the counsel you hear from other people as well, even in this church, is good counsel, is wise counsel. How do you know it's wise counsel? Because you need to compare it with the scriptures. But if you're not reading the scriptures, you see how a lack of knowledge can be a dangerous thing? Jeremiah 3.15 now, with that said, God does give us teachers in our life, 
right? They, 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 that they do serve a part. So it's not that just because, you know, the scriptures are the sole source of truth that people don't play a part in you gaining knowledge because God gives us teachers. He gives us pastors. He gives us evangelists and preachers and things like that in order to help teach us. Jeremiah 3.15, I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Hebrews 13.7, remember this, them which have the rule over you. So you see, there, there are authorities in your life. There is church leadership who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation. So yes, once you have the knowledge of God, once you have read and you know what you should be following, you need to find people that can be a good example to you and listen to their godly counsel, listen to their advice, because obviously they may know a little bit more than you just through experience. Right? Just from experience. Look at this. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honour, especially they who labour in the word and doctrine. So you see that there are the elders that are there to teach the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labour is worthy of his reward. So it's not just respect that we show to bishops of churches, but we ought to be giving to the ministry as well so that they are able to fulfil their needs. First John 2. So you see here that people have a place. But we, re we learn here in 1 John 2, it says, These things have I written unto you, so there's that reading of the word of God, concerning them that seduce you, but the anointing, talking about the Holy Spirit, which ye have received of him, abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now, you don't want to take this verse to mean that I don't need anybody to teach me, meaning that there is no purpose for teachers and instructors in your life. What this verse is teaching here is that because we have the Holy Spirit, because we have the scriptures, there's nothing that you are going to learn from me that you couldn't learn yourself from studying the Bible yourself, right? If you studied the Bible yourself with the Holy Spirit as your teacher, you will know everything that I know about the scriptures. But obviously it can be a benefit to you, it can be a shortcut to you, right? And excel your growth and accelerate your growth if you listen to wise counsel, you, you have that fellowship. You come to church and hear the preaching and learn more things from the Word of God. It's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a shortcut, right? Like it's harder to learn to cook yourself and, and learn all those things rather than just go to a restaurant, right? And have somebody cook it for you. But is there anything that the chef can cook that you couldn't cook if you put in the same amount of work? No, you can cook all the same meals. If you put in the effort, you put in the, uh, put in the work to learn what you need to learn from the Word of God. All the ingredients are there. They're all the same ingredients, right, are available to us in the Word of God. But like I said, God gives us pastors, right? He gives us elders. He gives us people to teach us the Word of God. And you need to be there to learn. That's why it's important that people come to church and they come and they sit under the preaching because this is where the Spirit of God moves. And sometimes the Spirit of God will reveal something to you and teach you something when you're a part of the body of Christ and, for, and you know, obeying God by not forsaking the assembly. You may learn something that you may not learn just from hearing the recording later. Yes, you can hear the sermon later on, but you know, as I've always learned in my spiritual life as well, sometimes you want to be where God wants you to be because the Spirit may speak to you at that moment something that you may not get somewhere else. And you know, people often talk to me sometimes, and I'm just reflecting on this when you know, people will say things to me like, uh, you know, uh, you, know you, you should preach a sermon on this or you should preach about this. And, and sometimes I think to them, well, I, I did actually preach on that. I have actually preached on that topic. It's just you may not have been at church when I touched on that topic or maybe you haven't gone back and listened to the sermons. So I would definitely recommend you guys, if you haven't already, you know, if all you're getting are just the sermons week in, week out, at church but you didn't join this church at the very beginning i would definitely recommend you go back and listen to those sermons because not only would you learn a lot about what i believe and what the bible teaches you know you'll, you'll know what my positions are on a lot of things and and it'll answer a lot of your questions and then that way um you know i don't necessarily have to repeat myself if you've done the work already you know and and gone and listened to the sermons that i've already preached uh, what's another way Obviously, prayer is a way that we can get knowledge. We ask God to help us to learn. Proverbs 2, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and lifteth up thy voice for understanding, 
If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So you see, so not all knowledge is necessarily good knowledge, right? You need to have the knowledge of God. You can learn a lot, but if you don't have a lot of knowledge of God, you're not going to necessarily grow in judgment and be able to discern what is right or what is wrong. And that's why I always tell people, you know, like when, when uh, sometimes new believers, right, new believers, they, 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 they come across like a really good preacher online that they want to listen to. And that's how they start their spiritual growth. And it's, it's a very dangerous thing when new believers, they, they start getting into the word a little bit, and then they come across a lot of sermons online and then that's the majority of how they're learning is when they're just listening to preachers online and whenever i start with a new believer and i try and give them advice i always tell them first and foremost you need to be reading the bible because you need to know what the bible says before you listen to a lot of preaching about the bible and that's something that you know i definitely encourage you guys to do too whereas if if the majority of your learning and the majority of your bible intake is just from my preaching that's not good because obviously that's my take and that's my a lot of my opinions going into interpreting that scripture it's not the holy spirit always just it's just not raw holy spirit right talking to you like when you read the bible and that's always a dangerous thing because now your foundation of your knowledge is not the scripture it's somebody else's teachings and you don't want that to be it you want the foundation of your beliefs to be scripture and i always tell people if you believe something and you don't know what the bible teaches about that you can't go to the verse and say i believe this because of this scripture passage and this, you know, and I can actually go there and show you why I believe something, then your religion is based on a man. You know, like if you're just thinking, I believe this and I don't know why, I don't know where it says it in the Bible, but I've heard somebody preach it before, I've heard it in a sermon, that's a dangerous foundation to have. You don't want your faith to be based on somebody else's teaching, right? You need your, your faith based on the word of God. You need to know what you believe. You need to read the Bible. You need to be familiar with the Bible so that your foundation is the word of God and not a man. Uh, another thing, James 1.5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That give it to all men liberally and abradeth not and it shall be forgiven and it shall be given him. So you ask God as well to help you as you read the Bible. Ask, you, know, you pray to God. I mean, I, I, there's countless times where I'm trying to figure out a passage and I'm asking God to open my eyes so that I can understand this passage. And, um, you know, that I believe God does. You know, I believe God answers that prayer. And as you read the Bible and you meditate on things, something may just come to your mind. And that's the Holy Spirit teaching you through the Word. All right. So what are some ways people can be destroyed? for a lack of knowledge, as we first read in Hosea 4.6. Different ways people can be destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Now, the first obvious one, you know, is through salvation, right? Like unbelievers not having the knowledge of salvation are, will obviously be destroyed by that because if they die without the Lord Jesus Christ or they die having a wrong understanding of salvation, many Catholics and Orthodox uh, and, and many Pente uh, you know, Pentecostals and many uh, Protestant people have a wrong understanding of salvation where they believe salvation is by works. And if they have that wrong knowledge, they will be destroyed for a lack of knowledge because they don't have the knowledge that salvation is by grace alone. And if they die in that state, they will spend an eternity in hell. Um, you know, I'm reminded of uh, when Anthony and I went soul winning just a couple of weeks ago. And if you remember, Anthony, we were talking to that guy, uh, that young man that we stopped on the side of the street. And, and, and this, this young man was very humble, you know, because he, he didn't really know much and he was willing to stop and to talk to us. And while we were, while we were kind of talking to him outside of this house, uh, the lady that was uh, living in the house in front of which we were talking, she sort of like saw us talking to this young guy and, and then she, she came out and um, she kind of looked upset and she kind of interrupted. She's like, oh, you know, sorry to interrupt. And she said to the young guy, he said, she says, do, do you actually want to talk to these people? Or, you know, do you actually want to, to move on and go? And, he, and it was funny because he actually said, no, 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 I did want to talk to them. <laughs> so that kind of showed her up, first of all, because she was expecting him to say like, no, and, and give him a way out. But he was actually to her saying, no, no, I actually did want to hear what they wanted to say. And we're, we're having a good conversation. And, and that's why, and this is why I always ask people, you know, like you'll notice that when you go soul winning with me, I don't just start 
telling people and just you know going into in depth i always ask them hey can i explain this to you right because i want them to want to hear me you know i don't want them just looking for a way out right because if that if i had not asked that guy right like maybe if he was a guy that didn't want to hear me just stop because he didn't want to be rude he didn't want to tell us to get lost or whatever and then that lady came out and said oh you know do you really want to talk to them he'd kind of be oh no it's my way out right but because i asked you know do you actually want to hear this and, and listen um, he did so we were talking anyways the other thing she said was um, because she was obviously upset she was the sort of person that you know doesn't want us going out talking to people but the interesting thing that happened was she actually said to me she said don't you think people already know this information you know do you really have to go out knocking on doors and and telling people about this don't you think people already know and, and, and this, the young man we were talking to was still there. And I sort of answered her saying, well, actually, no, a lot of people don't know what we're talking about. And, you know, we knock on all these doors and many people know about Jesus. And uh, you guys have probably heard me say this before. But a lot of people, you know, they know about Jesus, but they don't know how to go to heaven. And I asked her, like, what do you think it takes to go to heaven? And then she said, well, you just have to be a virtuous and a good person and then you'll be fine. And then I said to the young guy, I said, see, like, not everybody knows this, right? What I was just, because I had gotten just, I, I can't remember how far we had gotten, but we had just, I think, gotten to the fact where, you know, it was just by faith, it wasn't by works. And then she came out. And then I was saying, you know, a lot of people think it's by works. So it kind of worked out well that when she came out, she also was saying it was by works. So after I finished that conversation with her and she went back into her house, it was kind of a good segue because it was like, you see, a lot of people <laughs> think it's by works. But my point is, you see, a lot of people will be destroyed in terms of salvation for a lack of knowledge because they just don't know the right way to be saved. Yeah, a lot of people know about God. A lot of people know about Jesus. But a lot of people don't know that salvation is by grace alone and what that means. What that means is you don't need to turn from your sins to be saved. You don't need to keep the commandments to be saved. You don't need to join a church and be baptized and turn over a new leaf, try and live a good life, commit your life to Jesus. These are the things that are not required to be saved. And if people think they are required to be saved, they could be destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Uh, and, and, and I was just wanted to share this verse because this, this verse sort of reminded me of this lady where, you know, we tried to explain to her, but she just felt like she knew it all, right? And the Bible says here, better is a poor and wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. So you see, you'd rather be somebody that is a, is a child and is poor and has everything in the world, but yet you're no longer being, be, being willing to be instructed and to be corrected. Uh, let's look at other ways people can be destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because it's not just unbelievers that are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. It's believers as well. Because if a believer starts getting this idea that they need to work their way to heaven, or they need to you know, have these works, and if they don't have works, they're not really saved. Uh, other ways they can be destroyed in their faith through a lack of knowledge is if they get the wrong understanding of how God interacts with believers in the New Testament, that we're not under the Old Testament curse of blessing and cursing. And they constantly feel that God is, you know, they're under the curse of God and God is constantly angry with them and God doesn't love them anymore because the Old Testament talks about God forsaking them if they're not obedient and all this sort of stuff. If people have this lack of knowledge of the New Covenant and the New Testament, it's going to destroy their faith, right? They're going to start doubting their salvation. They're going to start doubting that God loves them and they're going to be an ineffective Christian. They're just going to throw in the towel because they're just kind of like, what's the point? I'm not perfect. I can never please God. So why even bother? And that people are going to get destroyed spiritually through that lack of knowledge. I want to share this passage with you in Hebrews 10, where it talks about the sort of attitude we ought to have when we serve God, right? Having therefore brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, right? We can enter in boldly to find grace to help in time of need. Why? Because we know we're saved. We know we're covered by the blood of Jesus. We can go boldly to God. Not this, you know, I think God is angry with me. I don't think God wants anything to do with me. I don't think God loves me anymore. You're not going to go to God boldly when you have that sort of uh, mentality of God. You don't have that knowledge of God that that's not the truth by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, 
You see, knowing that you're saved, right? Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. See, the profession of our faith is that we know that we're saved, that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved. You do that with boldness because you know you're saved, right? But if you lack knowledge and you don't know that you're saved or you get duped into believing that you can't have this assurance and that God is angry with you, that God doesn't love you, you don't really know you're saved. I mean, how are you going to be bold without wavering in your, Christ, in your Christian witness? For he is faithful, that promise. You see, God is faithful to us. You know, he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. See, you, you may forsake God. You, know, you may do the wrong thing, but God will never forsake you. And when you have a lack of knowledge of how eternal security works, of how the New Testament and the Old Testament work, you have this lack of knowledge, you could find your faith destroyed and you being a less effective witness. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So you see, as you have that full assurance and you have that unwavering faith, you can be a blessing to other people as well and to their walk. Uh, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So you actually have to know each other and fellowship with each other to provoke each other unto love and good works. So we are in this spiritual war, right? I won't read all Ephesians 6, but take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So we know we're in this battle. We know we're in this spiritual battle. The spiritual battle is a spiritual battle of words. And look at what our offensive weapon is. Our offensive weapon is the Word of God. But if you don't read, you don't have that knowledge, you don't know the Word of God, how are you going to use your weapon, right? Because you're not swinging a book at people, right? You need to actually learn the Bible, know the Bible, so you can use the Bible in the fight that we're in. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly. See, the more you know, the more you're sure of, the more boldly you're going to speak the Word of God to make known the mystery of the Gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. 2 Corinthians 10, look at this. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself, look at this, against the knowledge of God. See, so that's the fight. The fight is against the knowledge of God. We need to stand up for the knowledge of God, but you need to know the knowledge of God to stand up for it, right? How can you stand up for something that you don't even know? How can you fight for something that you have no knowledge of? and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So there is this spiritual fight going on, right? Not only do unbelievers get destroyed, believers can have their faith destroyed, but also Christianity can be destroyed, right? Because people are no longer fighting for Christianity, and Christianity gets destroyed in a nation like it does today, where people are finding it hard to stand up for the Word of God because they don't have the knowledge, or they have the wrong knowledge, right? And they're taking stands that are inconsistent, right? When they say like, you know, we don't really have anything against the homosexuals, yet they, have, they believe a book that says homosexuality should be punished by the death sentence, right? And it's like, well, how do they stand there as a Christian and, and say, oh yeah, we don't have anything against homosexuals, when the book that you base everything you believe on is condemning of the act of homosexuality. It's just that because they don't have this knowledge, they're trying to explain away, uh, you know, what the Bible clearly says. So, you know, one, one thought I have is, you know, back, back before, I don't know if it's like maybe a couple of decades before, but I feel like the fight before was a fight of, you know, evolution versus creation. You know, like back, you know, back a couple of decades ago, you know, that's where the church was falling behind. That's where believers were falling behind. Where we didn't have the knowledge, we didn't have the expertise out there, people making the arguments that were sound, and, and we fell behind, right? And then, you know, science, so now science is all about evolution, and that's where people question the Bible. Whereas nowadays, if you're an evolutionist, you're the irrational one. Like, how, how can you believe everything came from nothing? Because people now have the knowledge, they understand what evolution teaches, they understand the philosophy, and they can now argue against it, right? That's why when you run into an atheist, I mean, hopefully you guys are at the point where you know how to answer them. And, you know, like, I'm not scared to talk to an atheist, you know, and, and, and you know, talk about who's more rational, you know, whether there's a God or not, because I have plenty of examples, plenty of ways to show them, no, no, don't call me irrational, you're the one that's being irrational, and let me explain to you why, you know. And that's where you want to get in your Christian walk, right? 
So a couple of decades ago, that was the problem. But it seems like now Christians have caught up in knowledge, right? Where that's not really a threat against the Bible anymore because you know, now people are starting to see that evolution, evolutionary theory is what's irrational and unscientific, not the creation theory. But what I feel now where the fight is of people really attacking the authority of the Bible, attacking whether it's the word of God and people can hold to it consistently, is the Old Testament laws. I don't know if you guys agree with me. I mean, obviously, the Bible is probably just being attacked left, right and center at all angles. But I find in my own life, when people really want to ridicule and scoff at the Bible, what, what do they go to? They try and go to all the Old Testament laws and go, oh, you believe in slavery. You believe that if somebody rapes somebody that they should get married. And really, it's just all this misunderstanding of what the Bible actually teaches. I mean, I remember Nath had one uh, comment on his Facebook saying, oh, you know, Nath, looks like you shaved that beard, like all nice and neat. You know, are you really following the Bible? As though the Bible condemns having a haircut? I mean, are you seriously kidding me? So, but my point is, as Christians, we need to know this. You know, too often we have just stuck in the New Testament and ignored the Old Testament and ignored how to answer these questions. And this is something that we need to grow as as Christians. You need to understand why, why do we not follow every commandment in the Old Testament and know how to answer that. The ones that we do follow, understand them so that you can correct people that have a misunderstanding of these verses. You know, a misunderstanding of what you know, when the Bible talks about owning people and talking about servanthood, that it's not the oppressive slavery of the blacks in the cotton picking days and all that sort of stuff. So, and I'm not, and obviously there, there's, there's, there's a lot of examples, but I don't know about you guys, but I feel like that's where the fight is right now to defend the Bible. Like a lot of, and, and, and the reason why I feel like that's where the fight is because a lot of Christians don't understand the Old Testament laws. Like, could you, could you explain to somebody with comf confidence, with faith unwavering, with boldness, why God puts the death sentence on homosexuality? Or do you stray away from that conversation because you're not so sure why God puts the death sentence on homosexuality? Why he puts the death sentence on adultery? Why he puts the death sentence on bestiality? Why does God do these things? So you, these are the sort of things I'm talking about that you need to understand, that you need to be convinced of. You need to know why God does these things so you don't shy away from that conversation. So you're, you speak boldly when you try and defend the Bible. And this is why, like I said, you know, God says my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Like we just don't know these things. We don't have this knowledge. And the, you know, I'm talking about the majority of Christians. I'm not saying like, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure 100% what all you guys know. But I'm talking about Christianity in general. This is why Christianity is getting destroyed in our country because Christians have a lack of knowledge or they have the wrong knowledge and they end up doing damage to the cause of Christ. Like all the Christians that are saying, why are you being so judgmental? Oh, you know, we, we're not judgmental. You know, the Christians that put up their hands and like, don't call me judgmental. I'm not a judgmental Christian. And it's like, why do we, why do we waver from that? Why don't we just explain to people that it's not wrong to judge? and show people that they're even judging. Did you guys see that comment on my profile photo where this guy's like, who are you to cast judgment on people? I always answer that question with, are you judging me? Because like, you know, it's, that's what they're doing, right? So it just throws it right back on them. You know, when people say, oh, you're so judgmental and you're like, are you, are you judging me? Like, you know, of course, of course everyone is judgmental. See, wait, you know, it's like with anything, right? You know, like, you know, they, they, they try and say that their love and we're hate no, they're love and hate, and we're also love and hate. You know, we're both love and hate. You know, we're both judgmental because that's just, you know, that's what rational, sane people are. If you love things, you hate things. And if you think things are true, you're going to judge things are wrong. And they do it too. They're just being hypocrites. They just don't acknowledge that they do it. It's like when they say we're being religious, they're being religious too. They just don't call what they believe religious, you know? So look at what it says here. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You see, if we are to be the salt and the light, we hide our light, right? We're not bold and, and we're not salty enough. You know, our salt doesn't have any flavour. What's salt? is the truth. Then what good are we? Look, it says salt is good, but if the salt hath lost its savour, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dung hill. So you're, you're not even fit to be put as part of a pile of dung. Like That's what they say, how useless a saltless Christian is. But men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. I hope you hear this, 
that God is saying here that if you don't have salt in yourself, you're useless. That's what he's saying here. You need to have the salt, otherwise you're not going to be a useful Christian. You're not going to be effective. Now, how are you going to retain your knowledge? Right? Because you can learn all this knowledge, but if you forget it, what's the point? Right? So you want to retain that knowledge. How do you retain your knowledge so you don't forget? Well, let's look at James 1. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. So there's that gathering of that knowledge. But it says here, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Why are you deceiving your own self when you hear and hear and hear the word but don't do it because you believe you are more spiritual than you actually are? You believe that you're useful, right? But then you're not being useful because you're not doing anything. So this is why you're deceiving your own selves because you think, I, I'm this Christian, I have all this knowledge, I know all this doctrine, but if you're not actually doing anything, you're deceiving yourself into thinking you're something that you're not. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. You see, if we don't, if we just hear the word and we don't do it, they're saying it's like somebody looking at themselves in the mirror. They see a problem, but then they go away from the mirror and they completely just then forget what was the problem, right? But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, so you actually do it, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. So if you don't want to forget the knowledge that you have learned, you need to do the knowledge that you've learned. You need to teach the knowledge that you've learned. See, if you teach somebody and you preach to somebody something that you have learned, you won't forget it. That's why you never forget the gospel, right? Those of you who go soul winning, I mean, that stuff you can just spout. You know, it's like me. I, I could probably preach a sermon on salvation, just like not even like preparing it, just because you, you know what you say. You've said it so many times and you will never forget what you've learned because you are a doer of the work, right? In the sense that you're actually preaching it. It's the same with doctrine. If you learn it and you do it, you apply it, you meditate on it, you try to teach it to other people, you won't be a forgetful hero. You'll retain the knowledge that you have. So there are many ways, right, that we can apply the knowledge that we learn. Obviously, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Um, I talked about this, Proverbs 15, 7, the lips of the wise disperse knowledge. You see, so a wise person is not just somebody that absorbs knowledge. A wise person is also somebody that disperses knowledge, right? But the heart of the foolish doeth not so. And just ending on this one, 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. See, and this is, this is a command of God, right? This is something which is meant to be seeking knowledge, dispersing knowledge. Why? So that we can be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. See, we want to be ready because we, we, we don't always get an opportunity to speak to people, right? Like some, sometimes people, there, there are opportunities right where they may ask you, right? And you get an opportunity when they're curious, when they're inquisitive to answer that question. And if you're not ready at that point, you might have missed that opportunity to ask them. I mean, I think back to when I was younger. Obviously, you can't be perfect. You're not going to get every single opportunity. But I think back to, you know, to when I was, you know, first got saved, you know, trying to get my friends saved, trying to preach to them the Bible, trying to convince them of the Bible, and just the many wrong things I told them back then, right? Kind of a zeal of God, not according to knowledge. And, you know, you just wish, like, you know, you had the knowledge that you had now back then. You know, obviously, you can't change things in the past. But you can reflect on that. You can make a change now and say, you know what? I don't want to, you know, have a zeal of God not according to knowledge. I, I want to actually know what I'm talking about so that when I talk to people, when I get that opportunity, I'm ready to give them an answer to, to every man that asks me a reason of the hope that's in me with meekness and fear. Right? So with meekness and fear. With meekness and fear. So again, we're always trying to speak the truth in love. We're always trying to have our speech always with grace, seasoned with salt. Right? I was actually talking about this. I'll just share this with you guys because I was talking about it with my wife last night. You know, we're like the salt and the light of the earth, right? And I just had this thought where, you know, if somebody is in darkness, right, and 
you know, they're, they're, they're in darkness and, 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 and how would you want to help them, right? You'd want to slowly bring them out of darkness into light because if you just got a neon, you know, or LED, you know, overhead light and, you know, they're in darkness and you just shined it right into their face, I mean, you're going to do a lot of damage, right? Because you can actually blind people, you're going to damage their retinas, you know, and they're, they're almost going to be adverse to it, not because what you're showing them is bad because, you know, light is good, but almost too much in one go can be somebody can make somebody adverse to it. It's the same with salt, right? Imagine if I cooked you a meal and it was like salt and, and just like a little bit of food. You're going to be like, ugh, and it can actually be bad for you, you know? But a little bit of salt may, can make something very palatable, make them want to receive it. So we need to keep that in mind. That this, this is the sort of light and salt God wants us to be. Yes, we want to be light. We want to be salt. But we also have to think about how we disperse that salt, how we disperse that light, so that our speech is always with grace, seasoned with salt. You know, it's not our speech is always salt, seasoned with grace. It's the other way around, right? So, yeah, zeal is good. You know, and I'm not saying not be zealous, but if you want to be zealous with salt i was just thinking about this last night if you want to be zealous with salt say you've got a lot of salt that you want to give right you don't want to put all that salt into one meal but what might you do you might cook more meals right so that you can dispense the same amount of salt across more meals right so just think about that when we balance grace and love if you want to give more salt then you might need to give more grace as well you know so you have more grace with your speech so you can deliver more salt. If you want to be more salty, give more grace. Um, just a thought there. But we want to be ready. And, uh, you know, with meekness and with fear. So we, need to have, we want to have the right attitude. We, we need to also think about uh, how we represent ourselves. And obviously, we're not going to be able to, uh, you know, stop people from hating us, stop people from persecuting us. But it's something we should have in mind. We should never have the attitude of, of I'm just going to say it, however, and not care how people perceive it. We want people as much to receive it as possible. But if we've done all we can and we still offend them, so be it, right? So what's the conclusion? Don't be ignorant. You know, if you are ignorant, like the Bible says, you're going to be destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And you'll not only destroy your own faith, but you're going to contribute to the destruction of the Christian faith in general in a country. And, and you're not going to be, you're going to be unable, you know, we're going to get to the point where it might not be possible for us to reconstruct it because it's been destroyed so bad. So let's keep that in mind. I hope that was a reminder and encouragement to you. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, help us, Lord, to not be ignorant. Help us to not be destroyed for a lack of knowledge in our own faith. But Lord, help Christianity and the Christians of Australia and the world to not be destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Help us, Lord, to be knowledgeable Christians. So, Lord, we're not just like the ignorant uh, religious people of Islam and all these other false religions. Lord, help us to be different. Help us to speak uh, always with, with grace, uh, seasoned with salt. And we just ask you to help us, Lord. We need your grace. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.